Hi, everyone. Aaron Kramer here, President and CEO of, uh, of BSR. And um, I am delighted to be with you all for the fourth episode in our conversation series with MoFo, uh, ESG Influencers Leading Transformative Change. Um, we are honored and delighted to have Janine Guillot uh, with us today, the special advisor to the uh, chair of the, and I'm going to go to the acronyms in a minute, but I'll spell it out, if you will, at the start, International Sustainability Standards Board, a chair at the uh, International Financial Reporting. And Janine, you'll have to help me with the S. I'm blanking on it. Standard. Thank you. Foundation. Uh, Janine is um, uh, uniquely well-suited for this role. She has 30 more than 30 years of experience in senior leadership roles in financial services, uh, before she joined the Sustainability Advisory Standards Board as the CEO, uh, SASB, and now ISSB, she served as the Chief Operating Investment Officer for uh, California Public Employees Retirement System, CalPERS. That is a lot of acronyms in just a minute <laughs> or two. Um, Janine oversaw the investment office's business operations and also CalPERS corporate governance program, including integration of ESG factors into investment decision making. Um, in addition, Janine serves on the board of directors of Equilibrium Capital and on the Climate Related Financial Risk Advisory Committee to the US Financial Stability Oversight Council. She has also served uh, previously on the board of directors of the Marin Agricultural Land Trust for people who live in the California Bay Area. You know what a wonderful organization that is. Um, thank you, Janine, for protecting some beautiful land in Marin County and on the Senior Advisory Board at the Center for Responsible Business at UC Berkeley's Haas School of Business. Uh, Janine will provide insights on the ISSB's progress to deliver a comprehensive baseline, global baseline, of sustainability-related uh, standards board, uh, standards. And uh, just a, a quick word from me, I think there are very few developments as significant as what the ISSB is doing. In a world where reporting and disclosure requirements are changing rapidly and still with a bit of confusion, redundancy, uh, and so on. The ISSB has a crucial global mandate to create the reference point for sustainability reporting and disclosure. And, and I would say from having served on the board of the Value Reporting Foundation, which then flowed into the ISSB and which uh, Janine also led, she really brought um, a doggedness and openness to looking to try to bring the harmonization uh, that everyone knows we need and that everyone has been clamoring for for some time. And Janine has really be, been a key player in making that a reality. Um, uh, Janine will be um, interviewed in a dialogue with Suze McCormick. She is the global chair of the ESG, uh, Social Enterprise and Impact Inve Investing, as well as Energy Practices at MoFo. She'll be interviewing uh, Janine and Suze, um, two other things to say about Suze, um, I could say lots, but um, she was uh, an original board member at SASB, so has been at this also for quite some time, and she serves on the board of BSR as well, um, so thank you for that. So Suze and Janine, um, take it away, over to you. Well, thanks so much, Aaron, and, and good morning, everybody. I'm very excited to be here uh, with Janine. Um, I think we'll start with a little history. My my history with SASB actually came by way of Bob Eccles, um, who introduced me. I was playing around with corporate form and fiduciary duties and realized that if companies were going to have dual fiduciary duties, there is really going to have to be a way of measuring, benchmarking, and reporting on ESG the same as financials. And so I was introduced to the founder, Gene Rogers, and then was honored to serve on the original board. But I think it would be helpful to kind of take us back in history, to, you know, how, how and why was SASB formed? And then maybe we'll move through to where it is, where it is now. Sure, Susan, thank you for serving on that original board. And it's amazing how far the organization came. And I want to acknowledge Dr. Jean Rogers, who was the founder of SASB around 2011. Um, and Jean started with a very strong vision, which was to 
uh, embed sustainability into decision making, into both business and investor decision making. And she had three, what I think are core ideas that ultimately led to SASB's success. One was to connect sustainability performance to financial performance. And that uh, really, she had a hypothesis that strong sustainability performance could lead to strong business performance and increased business value. The second big idea was that sustainability disclosure should be industry specific because the sustainability information that was most or the sustainability issues that were most likely to impact financial performance were going to vary by industry. So what was most relevant in media is not the same thing as what's most relevant in agriculture. And then Jean's third big idea was to uh, model the process used to set accounting standards to develop sustainability disclosure standards. And that process is evidence-based and market-informed and transparent. So those were uh, the three big ideas that were embedded in SASB from its earliest days. And one of, maybe we could also, when I came to SASB, there were other standard setters, right? There particularly was the global reporting initiative. Um, and as you mentioned, but just to highlight, really SASB distinguished itself from G GRI working kind of in parallel, not, not conflicting with GRI to say GRI provides this information in a way for all stakeholders, but really, can you talk a little bit about the True North uh, for SASB? Yeah, and so GRI, the way to think about GRI, which had been in existence for quite some time, which was the leading framework for disclosure of sustainability issues to multiple stakeholders. So how do a company's actions impact society and stakeholders and disclosing that information to multiple stakeholders? SASB wasn't in conflict with GRI. Think of SASB as essentially the subset of that information that is most relevant to investor decision-making. So, um, and that's generally industry-specific information that's most relevant to a decision investor would make to buy or sell or hold uh, security. I think one of the ways it's it's inartful, but you know, the, the SASB is sort of single materiality. How how the ESG factors you know, implicate bottom line, you know, could implicate value, and GRI is much more sort of double materiality, sort of you know how it impacts in addition to investors, sort of everything else. So tell us. Um, a little bit about you um, and how you got to, to SASB because we, we intersected briefly, but um, I think as, as Aaron says, I know SASB was incredibly lucky to have you um, and uh, we'd just love to hear about your, your decision to sort of move over from being one of the leading the efforts of one of the largest asset owners um, to really helping to set the standards. Yeah, so I had a career in investment management. I was on both the uh, asset management and the asset owner side, which was uh, extremely helpful. And what really brought me to sustainability was my experience at CalPERS when I led development of the investment beliefs for CalPERS. And those were guiding principles to guide management of the investment portfolio. And it was, it was a, a big effort to align our trustees, our investment team, and the stakeholders of the fund on the guiding principles for managing the portfolio. Those investment beliefs include three beliefs that today we would think of as broadly sustainability or ESG beliefs, including um, a belief that to deliver long-term returns requires effective management of three forms of capital, human capital, financial capital, environmental capital. And we really, um, at CalPERS at that time, got interested in embedding ESG into the investment portfolio because we were looking at it through the lens of risk and return. How, how does a long-term investor manage risk and return? And, but the, the issue we had at that time, and I come from chief operating officer background. So I've always been the person who has to put data and technology in the hands of investment portfolio managers. And I knew that there was a gap between saying we wanted to embed ESG in investment decision-making and actually being able to do that. And that gap was data and information. And 
what I would call investor quality information. Uh, that's information that's comparable, that's consistent, that's reliable. And I felt that Gene's vision and the vision around SASB was the path to closing that gap and getting investor quality information in the hands of portfolio managers. So I joined, I joined to help bring Gene's vision to life. That's great. It's interesting back to, to the work that you did prior to SASB. I think it's one of the, Aaron and I have talked a lot about sort of the, the, the forces at play, the anti-ESG movement. I mean, one of the things that has happened, if you take a GRI definition, maybe 250 factors, you can point to a whole segment of, of ESG that may not be material to operations for a given company is an extension of philanthropy or corporate social responsibility. But what's happened over the last 30 years is some of it, as you said, you know, you were looking at this from an asset manager purely as risk management as, you know, how it was going to impact returns. In addition to the fact that we now have a whole segment of ESG that is regulatory compliance. I, I've sort of watched as things that were over here kind of nice to have, you know, you really shouldn't bribe people. Then all of a sudden there's regulation and you have FCPA or, you know, you really should think about your data privacy. All of a sudden you have, you know, data privacy rules because the world has changed. And so you sort of have ESG, which is part compliance, part, you know, really driving investor value and then sort of everything else. I think that's one of the reasons why, because the terminology is so broad, but I think it's really important when I, when I talk to people about SASB, you know, they, to understand kind of how it evolved. So these are standards and, you know, a large number, and you'll tell us in a few minutes, a large number of public companies are, have now adopted them and are reporting according to the SASB standards. So take us through kind of how, how the standards were developed. Yeah, so, you know, and Jean was an engineer and I want to give, um, give Jean credit for that. I mean, she still is an engineer by training um, because part of what she did is she brought this engineering process oriented mindset to standards development, which I think was incredibly valuable. And so the standards and also modeled the accounting standards process, which includes uh, significant transparency and significant input from both companies and investors. So the standards were originally developed sector by sector. There are 11 sectors, 77 industries that the SASB standards cover. And they were originally developed by starting with a research process to identify what are the issues that could potentially impact value in that specific industry. Um, and that research could be, you know, academic research, uh, sell side research, buy side research, and actually what companies were disclosing, because risk factor disclosures provide a wealth of information about what issues companies think could impact performance. So cast a very wide net, developed a high, hypothesis about the sustainability issues that could potentially impact financial performance and value in a sector, and then did an extensive consultation process with both investors and with companies to get feedback on both, uh, were those the most relevant issues? And then what were the best metrics to measure performance on those issues? Um, so that involved multiple rounds of consultation, including written consultation that's still available on the SASB website. Um, it took six years from start to finish to develop the first set of standards. And that first set of standards was issued in the fall of 2018. So that was the process. Yeah, I like to tell people, people are like, yeah, I think there are people who believe all of this is, is sort of new or Elvis, you know, two years ago, ESG sprung out and every law firm put out a, you know, has a, has a group now. But, you know, as, as you said, SASB started back in 2011 yeah. and then it was, for changing accounting standards, you know, six years is pretty quick. But in fact, you know, there was a lot of input. And, you know, these working groups, if you look at the working groups by industry, maybe share a little bit more. I mean, almost every, you know, large company within an industry were contributing to that industry specific standard. And then Tell me about sort of the broad swath of investors as well. Yes. So it was both things. There were there were industry working groups formed that had companies and some investors in them, and they provided input to the standards. Um, and then the investor feedback was invaluable. And especially after the first set of standards were developed, um, 
we had uh, asset managers who were very generous with their portfolio manager's time to provide, and portfolio managers in an asset manager are usually organized and focused on sectors. And so to have that kind of sector specialist investor feedback into that set of standards about what issues they felt were relevant when they evaluated a company, that was that was invaluable. Um, so yeah, six years, um, a lot of work and a lot of invaluable feedback from thousands of people actually. Um, it was, it was a painstaking process. And I think, you know, people, you can still criticize it. You can look at, you know, what's in a privacy standard and say, you know, it doesn't quite tell our story, but from my perspective, you know, that that's the point. These are not, these are not, you have to say, you know, these three things, this is not, you know, regulation SK, these are guidelines and standards for a company to give them a baseline about the information that is material to operations and should be included. And maybe Janine, you can talk a little bit about because I was there and sort of where it was included. Because initially, I think there was a large push to make sure that this was embedded and included within the financials. So um, really within the the you know the 10K, the 10Q for for companies. And I know that the first folks that started reporting on SASB actually started saying, yes, it's material operations. But you know we're going to have a reference in our required reporting, but all the detail is going to be in our you know, in our sustainability report. So can you talk a little bit about kind of where people re are reporting this data, first of all, and then second, kind of what about adoption? Because at first it was a long slog and I, the, I know the floodgates have opened. I mean, I, I go, I told you, I went to this event, you know, with, you know, 200 in-house counsel and these, you know, young, young in-house counsel were coming up to me and they're like, you know, we're certified SASB. And I was like, great. <laughs> So excited. <laughs> yeah. So to your point about floodgates, I mean, what we saw is um, a slow trickle in the earliest days immediately after codification around 2018. And then it's just been, you know, double digit uh, increases in reporters every year since then, to the point where we now have over uh, 2,500 companies report using the SASB standards, over 70% of the S&P Global 1200. And the Global 1200 are um, the largest companies in the world in all developed markets. Um, so over 70% of the S&P 1200 now report to the SASB standards, significant concentrations in the US, in Canada, in Europe, and Latin America. So it's been a tremendous uh, success story. And back to your point, Suze, around how long accounting standards take, um, I think what's important to remember here is, you know, we've gone in roughly 10 years from SASB being an idea in a research paper uh, to now being used to developing a full set of standards and then having those standards be used by over 2,500 companies. So I think it's incredibly rapid. And it's a testament, I think, to the strength of the idea, the original idea, which is identify the sustainability issues relevant to business performance. Those are, those are generally industry specific and develop standards using a transparent process. And I think those are all the things that have led to this uh, very rapid adoption. And I just wanted to pause because we have a number of people on who are in the private company world, the private market. So they're either investors, private equity venture, or they are private companies. Um, and your views, while, you know, they don't have to, you know, unless they're a public benefit corporation, they don't have to, you know, they don't have to publish to their shareholders. A lot of them do publish sustainability reports, but even more importantly, especially on the, the, the private equity, I found that SASB provides the basis for a very important sort of materiality map that you can do as a private company, which is let's look what companies in our industry sector believe is material. And we then can start, you know, measuring and benchmarking because, you know, a, it would, you know, it will increase value if we sell because we, you know, we have the data points that our acquirer, particularly if they're public needs, but B, if we go public, we're already tracking, but C, it's just good business. So thought, I mean, how much do you intersect with the private markets and the venture and private equity? Yeah, significantly. And that's that actually was one of the things that most attracted me to SASB, especially coming from a large asset owner. So, you know, at CalPERS, we were one of the biggest public equity investors in the world. I mean, private equity investors in the world. So 
we always wanted had a vision of a comp, you know a consistent framework to talk about managing ESG risk across both the public and the private assets, and that's that's both equity and debt. Mm -hmm. And in a perfect world, similar information across the public and the private assets across both equity and debt to evaluate risk. And so the fact that the SASB standards can be used easily in both public and private assets, that was incredibly powerful and attractive. And we do see significant use of the SASB standards today in private equity. Um, they're used more often in due diligence as a due diligence tool to address material sustainability issues during due diligence, less during reporting, but we're seeing increasing interest in using the SASB standards in private company reporting to uh, GPs and then ultimately to LPs. Uh, so the reporting may not go out into the public markets, but there's significant reporting, as you know, Suze, that goes to uh, the end investors in um, LPs and asset owners. That's exactly right. And one of one of the drivers is, you know, SFDR and some of the regulations. So the SEC has been a little, it's interesting here because again, if you're a lawyer, you look at the SEC, they haven't posted rules, but meanwhile, companies and investors are already reporting on this stuff. And so to some extent, we'll get to sort of the SEC is, is lagging um, on climate and human rights and cyber and some of these areas. Europe is not. And so any fund that has European LPs and especially funds that are opting into articles eight and nine, they're not only requiring reporting, they're going further and it's it's changing the investment terms because they have to ensure they have to ensure positive output or no material harm. So it's really been a game changer. But I think looking at Europe, I want to come back to kind of the evolution. So we started with, uh, you know, we started with 50 standard setters, but really sort of I view them the big three, which is the, the US, SASB, um, and the IIRC, and then GRI, and we've distinguished GRI. So take me through, there was sort of a merger and then a second merger, and now you're under sort of the international financial reporting standards, which are really, they set the rules for financial reporting for companies ex US, but I want to be clear, the gap has said, you know, we're not coming up with a separate standard. So even US companies that report financials according to gap will be looking at the new rules. But with that background, why don't you take us through kind of yeah. the evolution from SASB now to the ISSB? Yeah, and we've heard, I mean, we've heard some people, even people who have wanted harmonization to happen for decades have said, oh my, this is happening almost too fast because we can't follow the evolution. Um, but I think if we go back to, to basics from the earliest days of SASB, um, and one of the, the biggest groups of supporters of SASB were investors who, who really valued the, the concepts. Um, investors from day one were clear they wanted a global standard because investors hold global portfolios. So whether you're an investor sitting in Frankfurt or an investor sitting in London or sitting in New York or sitting in San Francisco or sitting in Hong Kong, you know, those investors all hold global portfolios. And so in order to manage risk, they really valued a global standard so that um, they could uh, compare performance with companies around the world. So from the early days of SASB, we had a vision for a global standard. Um, at the same time, there was IOSCO, and I want to give credit to IOSCO for this, the world securities regulators, they were hearing the same feedback from their primary stakeholder group or investors. And so it was this simultaneous movement around the world to try to figure out how a, how a global baseline could be established. And the most logical place for that to happen is under the IFRS Foundation. So the IFRS Foundation is the parent parent organization of the International Accounting Standards Board. The International Accounting Standards Board sets accounting standards that are used in over 140 countries around the world. It has been a huge success story um, in terms of the breadth of the adoption of the accounting standards. So it was very logical to put um, sustainability standards under that IFRS umbrella. And uh, 
they decided to create the International Sustainability Standards Board, and we merged SASB and integrated reporting into that uh, this year. So that's that's the history. Now, what does that mean for the U.S.? And you know, I said that I that IASB's accounting standards are used in 140 countries. They are not used in the U.S. We use in the U.S. U.S. GAAP. But what's important about the sustainability standards is they're intended to be gap agnostic. So whether the company is reporting its financial results to US GAAP, to international accounting standards, to another local accounting standard, uh, the sustainability standards can still be used. And we expect the ISSB standards to be widely used in the US. Uh, because they do leverage the SASB standards, which are already widely used, and because there is very, very strong investor support for the ISSB. So even if the SEC doesn't mandate the use of ISSB standards, which I don't think they will, we expect that the ISSB standards would be used on a voluntary basis. And let's uh, before we go, I'm gonna I want to drill down a little bit on on the SEC rules because I am a lawyer. Um, yeah. We do. If folks on the phone and on the on the Zoom have questions, um, please you can put them into I don't know which is going to work better, the Q and A or the chat. I'll quickly check those every couple minutes. The Q and A, great. Um, put it into the Q and A, and I will check it. Um, questions for for Janine. Um, but while people are thinking of the questions they want to ask you, let me turn to the SEC, because when I was on the SASB board, um, every SEC commissioner that cared about climate and ESG was actually had left and was on the SASB board. <laughs> so we had a period of time where we were sort of looking over at, this, at, at the SEC and they're going, I'm not sure anything's going to happen over there because everybody seems to be over here. Um, but um, that, that didn't in fact happen. Now we do have some proposed rules. We have proposed rules around cyber. Obviously we have proposed rules around climate. Um, and coming, we understand proposed rules are around uh, human rights. So, t tell me, you know, you're a, you're a U.S. company. Um, you know, my impression is there there's not going to be there's not going to be conflict. There will be overlap. But tell me tell me about the interplay between sort of a voluntary reporting on SASB and and the SEC rules. Yeah. So uh, you know, I don't know what the SEC is going to do, and I'm not going to speculate on what the SEC is going to do. Um, but I think if we assume that the SEC is going to broadly, I think particularly for climate, follow the broad outlines of the TCFD, the Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosures, which many companies already report to and which the ISSB standards are also being developed on. I think there will be very broad similarities uh, generally between an SEC's climate rule and the ISSB's climate standards. So that's very, very good news for US companies. However, the ISSB will have something that the SEC will not have, which is going to be uh, a requirement to have industry specific disclosures and suggested industry specific disclosures based on the SASB standards. And that's why I think investors, uh, companies should expect that investors will ask them to continue to report that industry specific information in addition to whatever the SEC does. So that's gonna be the way to think, I think about this is that the SEC provides an overall umbrella of required disclosures. And then the ISSB provides supplemental disclosures, especially industry-based disclosures that investors need and want to see. So, so that's the way I think of this, Suze. That's, it's interesting. And I, I want to just drill down on that for a second, because when we were initially, and we did an analysis where the first standards were proposed um, by SASB, and we actually looked at sort of, okay, disclosure then made by, you know, 25 companies in that industry. And one of the things that was interesting is obviously it's, if it's being identified by companies and investors as material to operations, there was almost always some reference to it within the, the required reporting. Um, and really what SASB was doing is saying, you know, you have one line um, about, you know, potential impact on your supply chain of, of climate, for example, and climate risk, and really, what now the ISSB, formerly SASB standards are doing is providing 
what the investors want, which is a little more quantification, a little more data, a little more information about, about that risk or about that important data point. Um, and so that's at least what I've seen with the proposed rules coming out of the SEC. There's not conflict. It's just that with the voluntary disclosure, which, I mean, you can argue whether if you're, if you're, you know, if your investors required, is it, is it, or ask for it, is it really voluntary? Um, but, you know, at least not required by a regulator um, disclosure versus what is going to come out of, come out of the SEC. So SEC cyber rules, I, I, I originally, I was actually on record as saying, I thought, I thought that the climate rules were going to come out before the midterms. I was obviously clearly wrong. Um, I know there's been a lot of pushback and a lot of debate within the SEC and with, you know, the thousands, tens of thousands of comment letters on scope three and otherwise, but do you have any views about either the cyber um, or the climate rules coming out of the SEC and um, how granular they're, gonna, they're going to be, for example, you know, how, how important is it to include scope three emissions and climate and the same thing in cyber. I mean, one of the big is, you know, one of the big positives of cyber is also you, you're sort of responsible for reporting on all of your, all of your counterparties, because we're all related. Any, any views on that? Yeah, I don't actually, I don't have any views on what the SEC is likely to do there. I do have a strong view though, that uh, for granular requirements, uh, the accounting standards setting process is a better way to establish those requirements than regulation. Um, and, and the reason for that is, and it's something you articulated earlier, Suze, which is that this, it lets acknowledge reality that this is still a rapidly evolving field and particularly measurement is still a rapidly evolving field. So, you know, what we always heard on the SASB standards is, you know, pretty broad consensus that we had gotten the, the issues right. So data privacy, water management, um, supply chain management, but the metrics, people may not have always, particularly companies, necessarily agreed that we had the, yet had the metric right. And I think we just have to be humble and acknowledge this is an evolving field. And so one of the challenges I think with embedding detailed metrics and regulation too early is that it's then very difficult to change them. And so, whereas a, an accounting standard setting process can be inherently more responsive and evolve more quickly. Um, so that's my general thought, Susan. That's why, uh, we always have advocated for standard setting to do the industry-based really detailed metrics work. And then the regulation creates, you know, the framework that enables that standard setting to happen. That's the way I've always thought about this. Almost a baseline. Well, tell me, actually, I'll, I'll... Actually, as an aside, I'd love your views because what I'm seeing coming out that has been passed in the EU is incredibly prescriptive. And sort of, you know, I'm asked for you know a company that's opting into Article Nine. You know, is this investment in a biofuel, you know, going to qualify? And you know, 60 pages later, I'm trying to figure out, and I'm going to find. I, I think it's going to be difficult as as the world evolves. I'm interested in your views with that. I also want to hear one of the things that SASB was set up for is, was exactly this, which is these are you know, they can evolve. In other words, you, you have a regular working group. So when when either the, the regulation evolves or the world evolves in terms of how, we, how we're accounting for natural resources and we'll get to climate accounting in a second, the standards can evolve as well. So can yeah. you comment on either of those? Yeah, so, so definitely. I mean, to me, this idea of leveraging the accounting standard setting process, which is what I thought was one of Gene's originally brilliant ideas, it provides for that evolution. And that's exactly the kind of evolution that's needed, ongoing evolution in sustainability disclosure standards. So now, you know, that it's always though a tension between rapid evolution and due process. And one of the strengths of the accounting standards setting process is also due process and very transparent due process. So balancing due process with speed, I actually think is going to be the single biggest challenge for the ISSB um, because it's even more challenging to do that, I think, in sustainability than in traditional accounting. 
Um, so that's, uh, that's generally my thoughts about evolution of standards. On specifically on the EU, I think what's important to understand about the EU is that legislation is that there is a legal difference between the EU and the US around how corporate disclosure is and can be used. So in the EU, corporate disclosure is a tool of public policy objectives and is, if you look at all of the sustainable finance uh, legislation coming out of the EU, it, it is very clear that that disclosure is a tool to achieve uh, the EU's objectives around the Green Deal. And that is different from how disclosure is typically used in the US, where corporate disclosure and the corporate disclosure regime in the US is about investor protection and transparency and resilience of capital markets. So it's important to understand that difference because what I find is that uh, particularly American companies or investors who are, who are trying to implement the European legislation don't, don't understand the end purpose of that legislation. And I think it's helpful to understand purpose when you're actually trying to implement something. It is, but the interesting thing about it is you have a lot of then, you know, companies in, in the EU, EU who may be subject to the regulation and then investors out of the EU that are then LPs and US funds and or companies taking investment from the US. And so having this bifurcated system right now doesn't really work. Let's, let's, um, let's go back to the ISSB because one of the concerns I've heard is that the ISSB has moved to Europe. <laughs> um, can you just tell us a little bit about the function? You, you mentioned there was this foundation and this is underneath the foundation, just like the IFRS, but tell us a little bit about how, how it's organized and what is your role there? Yeah, so so it is important to distinguish, and I hear this in the U.S. all the time, that the IFRS and the European effort are essentially the same effort. And it's very important to understand they are not, they're different. So the European effort is a European legislative effort governed by Europe's um, political institutions, so European Parliament, uh, European Commission. So think of that as... Uh, analogous to, or, you know, the role that the US SEC would play in the US. That is the European effort. And then IFRS is an international organization uh, headquartered in London uh, that oversees international accounting standards that are used by 140 countries. And the IFRS foundation is overseen by a body of public sector organizations chaired by, very importantly, IOSCO, the world securities regulators. So think of, so the European Commission is a very important IFRS stakeholder. The US SEC is an important IFRS stakeholder, but the IFRS is an international organization. And so when you think about this, um, ultimately what gives the the IFRS standards, the IFRS has no uh, authority to embed its standards in regulation around the world, neither the accounting standards nor the sustainability standards. It's a private sector organization. Embedding the standards in law or regulation around the world is the purview of regulators in every major market. And that which regulator that is varies significantly. Depending on the market depending on the market. So in some markets, it's a securities commission, similar to our the US SEC. In other markets, it may be an accounting standards body. It, it varies by market. Uh, so it's very important to understand that dynamic around how IFRS standards get embedded in law or regulation around the world. And it's interesting, again, as a lawyer, and as I'm seeing you know, a lot of other firms over the last couple of years focus on this, if you view it just as legal compliance, you miss the fact that ESG you know, ha has been an area for 30 years and that in fact, there is a lot of precedent in addition to standards, you know, but standards being one of them set by the private industry, which is separate and distinct from regulation. And really the most important thing for both investors or company is understanding that 
and then understanding how that relates to the regulation that then passes. Because if you focus just on the regulation, you you, you sort of can miss <laughs> almost two thirds of two thirds yeah. of what's going on. Yeah, and that's my biggest fear, Suze, with the arrival of so many regulators to this space. My biggest fear is that ESG does become treated as regulatory compliance separate from business and investor decision making. And, you know, disclosure in my mind is not disclosure just for disclosure's sake. It is disclosure to inform investor and business decision making and have better decisions, right? Yeah. So I do think we're in this very kind of risky space right now where and I'm seeing this happen rapidly, where all of a sudden people talk about ESG disclosure through this compliance lens. Compliance is very, very important, but if it gets divorced from decision-making, then I think um, we've lost some of the value and you know all the work everyone's been trying to do for the last 20, 30 years. Um, no, I agree. And we also, I mean, we also have, I'll just, I mentioned this at the beginning, but now we have a, a, a lot of the anti-ESG uh, uh, sentiment that is, uh, you know, pervading the investment community, but also uh, legislatures. We've got 22 states in the U.S. either with pending or enacted sort of anti-ESG legislation. You know, so if an asset manager, it, it covers a lot of things, but generally, if an asset manager, you know, focuses on ESG in those states, either they can't avail themselves of, you know, state pension funding, or they can't do business in that state. I mean, they, they vary depending on the state. But one of my theories is we just we need different terminology. It's because sort of ESG has developed over 30 years and it used to be divorced from bottom, you know, it used to be good stuff on the side. It used to be corporate social responsibility, you know, plant a tree, civic responsibility. And then gradually a lot of it, you know, arguably some of it was always material operations, but it's clear, you know, climate risk is clear, cyber risk is clear. There are these areas where the risk is really clear and tied to and tied to operations and then um, and then also the compliance side, but you have the three sides and it's just such a big catch-all that I think, I mean, some of the criticism quite frankly is valid because you are part of a CSR policy, which is let's go plant a tree. While that may be good, it may not directly relate to, to the bottom line. So your thought, I'm hoping maybe that out of this will evolve a change in terminology. So we're all- Well, clear on I mean, the ironic, about. ironically, I don't know that a change in terminology will help anything because- okay. Ironically, the ESG terminology actually evolved to talk about risk and return. So if you go back from the investor side, as opposed to the corporate the side, side, it was yeah. very interesting because the company side, the, the language was CSR, the investor side, the language was impact investing, and which was about investing to achieve a specific social impact, often at a concessionary return and impact investing did not often, but sometimes with a concessionary return. Um, so the impact language had achieved, had, had, had gotten the connotation in the investment word, world of either actually or potentially having a concessionary return. And ESG language evolved to be clear that this was about integrating ESG factors into investment decision-making through the lens of risk and return. And in many ways, it was actually a process distinction. It was integrating ESG into your investment process in order, just as good hygiene, just as foundationally making sure you were taking into account all material risks and opportunities when you were making investment decisions. That was the original use of the term ESG in the investment industry. And some people actually criticized it because it didn't have the social impact dimension in it. And now fast forward 10 years and ESG is being used in a completely different way. Um, and the conversation is completely confused. So, Suze, I don't know that a new term is going to be helpful to be honest. I, I, I'm, just, I'm hopeful <laughs> that you know, because you now you have you have ESG that because sort of GRI when they embraced it, they took it. So this is what I mean. So broad, you have you know 250 factors. Again, what SASB and now the ISSB have done is saying, okay, these within those factors, let's hone in by industry. There's some cyber risk, climate risk, there's some that are universal, right? Human, you yeah. know, but there are others that are 
very industry specific. What is what if you're in heavy manufacturing, it's going to be different from if you're a software, you know, provider. It, it, it really does matter. And that's some of the fabulous work that SASB has done, which I'm really hardened to know will now be part of the ISSB guidelines yeah. and standards as well. So yeah. before I turn it back over to Aaron, kind of what's what's next? Yeah, so I think for everyone who's listening, definitely please, please sign up to follow ISSB developments. Uh, the ISSB has issued its first two uh, exposure drafts, one on general requirements for sustainability disclosure, uh, the second on climate-related disclosure, received over 1,400 comment letters on those two standards. Uh, and the board, the standards board is actively deliberating um, those, those responses. Actually this week, um, they're meeting and then continuing to uh, make the final decisions with a goal of issuing those two standards next week, next year, next week, they would kill me. <laughs> You're year. moving fast. Yeah, yeah, in, 20, in 2023. Um, and both of those, both of those standards leverage the SASB standards content. So strongly encourage everyone to continue to follow ISSB's developments and then uh, definitely continue to report in the interim to TCFD and SASB, which are, you know, the most commonly requested frameworks by institutional investors. So, uh, and then by reporting to TCFD and SASB, you will definitely be preparing yourself to ultimately report to the ISSB. That's right. And, and again, for private companies, I strongly recommend they at least know what the factors are so that they can start thinking about, and increasingly, you know, the investors in those Private, the private equity firms are requiring reporting, and a lot of them are requiring reporting because their LPs are requiring reporting. So exactly. it is, it's, it's a cascade. Well, Aaron, I know has a question, and then I'm, I'm going to turn it over to him and be quiet and, and let him take us out. Great, thank you both. Really rich conversation. Um, thank you so much for it, um, Janine. One question, just touching on a couple of other elements that are emerging in the overall ecosystem and how is wondering, I'm wondering how the ISSB is thinking about it. You've talked a fair bit about the TCFD. What about the task force on nature related financial disclosures, of course, with COP15 on, on nature happening right now in, in Montreal? And then also what about the ongoing ask on the part of shareholders for climate transition action plans? So how 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 if at all is is ISSB thinking about those developments, integrating them, referencing them, et cetera? Yeah, so let me take the transition plan first. Uh, definitely uh, disclosure around transition planning is part of the ISSB's climate disclosure standard. And one of the things when I mentioned the redeliberations, what that uh, could or should look like as part of those ongoing redeliberations. So uh, definitely companies should be thinking about transition plans. Um, then on nature, that's a, that's a really good point, Aaron. And especially it goes back to what Susan and I were talking about yesterday, um, earlier about uh, metrics. I think the huge value of initiatives like TNFD is to try to develop consensus around metrics global consensus around metrics, because that the ISSB as a global standard setter is never going to be the organization that is going to figure out all the metrics for all potential topics. And in fact, when we developed the SASB standards, we relied heavily on metrics that were already in use and had been developed you know, by industry groups or NGOs. And I view TNFD as providing invaluable work toward developing global consensus on nature-related metrics that could then be incorporated into ISSB standards in the future. Uh, the same thing's true of definitions, Aaron, both definitions and metrics. Thank you for that. And just um, before I do close us out um, for today and indeed for 2022 in this series, um, um, just one comment, because you, you both spoke a lot about um, how compliance enters into this. And Jeanine, I think the way you framed it is 100% right. And it's interesting, as we talk with our member companies, 
many of them, and we had numerous conversations actually at COP27 on this specific point, many of them are pointing out that the corporate controller is now sitting at the table in ways that are related to setting strategy, not only reporting and disclosure, but strategy. And, and I think the best way I can put it is there are a lot of growing pains uh, in, this, in this interplay for a whole variety of reasons, which is not to you know, throw any function or, or another under the bus. They all bring different things to the table and are learning how to work with each other. And uh, my view is, I, I think all of these efforts are are raising the floor, which is valuable. I think, as you say, we all have to make sure it doesn't simultaneously lower the ceiling on ambition at a time when great ambition is needed. So um, I, I'm glad you raised that point. Um, Janine, I want to thank you. Um, this is great. You're right at the center of one of the most important uh, things that's happening in our world, not only the world of ESG, but just in general, in, in my view. Thank you for that. And Suze, thanks to you and the wonderful partners at MoFo for uh, helping to make this series a reality to, to everyone out there in Radio Land, as they used to say. Um, uh, we, we will, I see this week that electric vehicles don't always include AM radio anymore. So further <laughs> putting AM radio into the past. Um, we will be back to you as quickly as we can with um, updates on um, the, uh, the series as it rolls out in 2023 for January and February uh, and beyond. So stay tuned. We, we want to continue to bring uh, important thought leaders uh, to all of you as we have here today with Janine. So with that, I just want to thank you for joining um, and wish everybody a happy New Year, and let's have a more boring year in 2023. I think our our all of our all of us should resolve to make 2023 a, a real yawner. Um, so, best wishes to everybody. We see you in the new year.